Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, September 19th meeting of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we do the roll call, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Larson to the uh, president's seat. Uh, Dr. Sopchik is uh, tending to his wife who had some real serious back surgery and uh, is dealing with uh, recovery today. So welcome and uh, kind of a, an interesting way to have your last meeting with this as, a, as the president, but uh, we're glad to have you, have you here. Roll call and recognition of visitors, uh, Ms. Schleist. Okay, this evening's visitors include Dick Carter, Jana Holwick, Colleen Cuttingham, Jamea Haynes, Lori Bell, and Roberta Eveslage. Thank you and welcome. We appreciate your attendance. Uh, awards and recognitions, Dr. Larson? We have no awards or recognitions tonight, Dr. Cook. Okay. Open forum is our next item on the agenda. The open forum section of the board agenda is a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium and should be respectful and civil and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance and or suggested suggestion processes or are otherwise the subject of review by the college or board. There are two registered speakers at tonight's meeting and you please come to the podium, state your name and address and uh, Make your and make your comments. The first is Beth Edmonds. Beth. Good evening. My name is Beth Edmonds. I am speaking tonight as president of the Johnson County Community College Faculty <laughs> Senate. I will use prepared remar remarks for two reasons. One, I'm not an excellent extemporaneous speaker, and two, I would like to keep under the five minute limit. Um, anyone paying very close attention to events at JCCC right now has heard about shared governance. It is an easy phrase to say, much more difficult to explain or define, even harder still to live by. Hearing the word shared governance <laughs> spoken should not lead the listener to presume that the speaker has an understanding of its basic tenets. What we say and what we think are important, but even more important is what we do, the actions we take. With the creation of two task forces charged with determining the near future of shared governance at JCCC, we have committed to educating ourselves about shared governance, but more than that, JCCC has declared its desire to design and implement policies and procedures that show to our community and our accrediting body that the faculty, administration, and trustees of JCCC will do more than speak or think about shared governance. We will commit to act in accordance with its principles. If we are honest, we must admit that this will be particularly difficult for us. We have not shown an inclination in this direction in the past, but speaking for the faculty, we approach the work of these task forces over the next few months with renewed hope and enthusiasm. The good news for us is that we have a unique opportunity right now to engage in meaningful discussions followed by actions which could lead to a substantive cultural change, especially within the academic branch. I hear from many JCCC faculty members full and part-time about their wishes for a real turnaround at JCCC and I am very hopeful that we can help bring this into being. <clears throat> Perhaps when you hear the term shared governance, you cringe because it is your paradigm that the boss should make the decisions for the employee. But at an institution of higher learning, to make all decisions top down often leads to poor decisions. To ignore expertise in matters of teaching and learning exposes us to consequences that are not fully understood by those doing the deciding and makes untenable situations for those who must deal with and those who must live with those consequences. Last year, I celebrated by receiving my 20-year service pin at JCCC. 
When I took on the role of mathematics department chair a little over three years ago, I was secure in the knowledge that the faculty in my department were trusted and valued as colleagues and knowledgeable professionals. It was understood that we are faculty with our primary focus on the success of our students, on our adjunct partners, and on our community as a whole. <clears throat> It took me fully two years as department chair to realize that my assumptions were not necessarily based in fact. It has been a deeply exhausting three plus years as I, with the support of my colleagues, have attempted to make the concerns and expertise of the department not just heard but acknowledged and then acted upon. It's no small thing for me to say here tonight that I have been largely unsuccessful. I'm certain this would not have happened at an institution committed to shared governance. However, certain recent events have given us reason to hope. One example is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. It was standing room only at the DEI info session during our professional development week. I was excited to see so many caring professionals in attendance, including one of our Board of Trustee members. One of the stated goals of the DEI Task Force is to help steer JCCC to develop cultural competencies, cultural humility, and cultural support and guidance that encourages students to communicate and lead in a pluralistic community while also preparing students for a diverse and global workforce. I'm proud of this faculty-led initiative that has grown into what I hope will be a real cultural shift at JCCC. It will take buy-in and lots of purposeful hard work from individuals at all levels to affect the hope for course correction or shared governance. If you will search for Faculty Senate on the JCCC website, you can make your way to our blog there is a 30-minute video presentation there of the recent faculty information sessions recorded on September 6th. You can get more information about JCCC's history of shared governance, including the HLC accreditation process as it relates to shared governance, and also information about the new task forces. In closing, I would like to note that when I was refused a place on the agenda for this meeting, I was made curious about the basis for recognition and legitimacy of service for this board. When the Higher Learning Commission acknowledges the role of the Faculty Senate at JCCC, why does the Board of Trustees fail to do so? I was elected as an at-large senator by the full faculty, then elected president of the Faculty Senate by unanimous acclamation. If not this, then what is the threshold which makes me a legitimate voice for the JCCC faculty? What voices are the trustees interested in hearing, if not faculty leadership, and what purpose is served by disallowing an elective faculty representative the courtesy of either a place on their agenda or a reason for their exclusion? Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, we really uh, have considered, I guess, who is on the agenda and how many people are on the agenda. There are a lot of groups and clubs that would love to be on the agenda, and I think at this point the Faculty Association has been given the position as they're the negotiating uh, unit of the faculty, but that's something that, again, can be discussed. But thank you for your remarks. Uh, we have a second person, uh, Dr. Barbara Larson. Oh, Barbara Larson, 14616 West 78th Street, Lenexa. Thank you, Dr. Cook, members of the board, and especially my colleagues here today. I've been fortunate to spend more than three decades as part of this extraordinary experiment called community, in America called community colleges, and even more fortunate to conclude my career at Johnson County Community College. I knew of JCCC's reputation before I arrived, and it has surpassed my expectations. I work with faculty of enormous talent and innovation. I work closely with staff who are highly knowledgeable and competent, and together we share a commitment to our students and to their success. Members of the board, I appreciate your vital role. As public servants and volunteers, you make exceptional commitments of time and of judgment. And in the coming months, you will make the most consequential decision a board makes, the selection of the college's next president. I have been through transitions such as this in the past, and I'm hopeful that the coming year will be approached in a professional, positive manner. 
Although your role includes oversight of the president and the administration, in my experience, successful colleges are those in which the administration and board operate from positions of mutual respect and partnership, not as adversaries. As I said, my colleagues in this room are the most professional and competent I've ever known. So it concerns me when I see that competence question, particularly in public settings. JCCC is well managed and staff here know their jobs well. But when they are challenged with gotcha questions or treated like hired help or accused of something other than their best of intentions, it is demoralizing. No doubt future candidates for the president's role are watching these meetings and observing the tenor of deliberations. If we are to attract the best candidates for the next president, we need to do better. I understand your need to learn about the college. Fostering that learning is most effective when it is grounded in courtesy, listening, and respect. In my past, a common practice, I would say a best practice, is when board members reach out to the president's office and explain that in the interest of transparency, they would like to hear more about a certain topic at the next board meeting. In this way, staff have appropriate advanced knowledge and can be, be, be prepared with the information requested. Our objective is to provide you the information you need to make the best judgments about decisions within your purview. But we cannot be expected to recall all aspects of our work at a moment's notice. Please help us serve you better by communicating in advance so that your issues may be comprehensively addressed. In closing, I'm Honored to have worked for JCCC, for President Sopcich, and for you as board members. Together, we can be proud of many accomplishments. At the same time, many of us spend more waking hours here than we do with our families. Consequently, the, consequently, the college becomes our second home. In this home, we nurture our students in transformative ways. I'm convinced that we can be more nurturing of one another as well. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. We'll have a chance to uh, thank Barbara uh, at the end of the meeting, but thank you for your remarks. Mr. Uh, next item, Mr. board report. Mr. Chairman. Students. Uh, Mr. Musil. Well, I, I think Professor Edmonds raised some points that, that are important to the board, um, not necessarily with respect to who gets to speak at board meetings, because anybody can speak in an open forum, but I, I do want to make it clear to the folks in this room and the viewing public that I don't think we have ignored shared governance. I don't think we have a consensus on what it means or how it is to be implemented. Um, but I want to make it clear to uh, the people watching this um, that uh, pay for this college that we have exercised shared governance in various forms and we can do better. And I agree with her that there's an opportunity to do that. I also want to make it clear that I don't think we have ignored cultural diversity, cultural sensitivity on this campus. In fact, this campus is the most welcoming place in Johnson County. Our percentage of Hispanic, Asian, African-American students is well above the county's percentage of average population. So can we do better? Yes in both shared governance and cultural sensitivity, but the sense that we are not doing anything or we are not doing it well at all should not be left uh, with the viewing public. Every one of these areas can be done better. I also want to make it clear that I don't think disagreement between faculty and staff and faculty and administration or faculty and trustee or trustees and staff is ever a one-way street. We can all do better listening and responding. Um, I appreciate Dr. Larson's comments. It was fortuitous that she ended up here coming from Florida. Uh, she has served us well, and her comments should be taken to heart by everybody. Thank you. Next report, Student Senate, Mr. Persai. And Keith, good to see you smiling. Yes. Everything yes. good with st Student yes. Senate? Um, how do I, oh, there it is. All right. So great to see so many familiar faces again. Um, I'm Ann Keith, the student president at the moment. Um, we just uh, got done with our senator elections. We've got a lot of new faces on board with Senate. Um, 
One of our main goals was as an executive board to try and fill the Senate, and we're well on our way to do that. We've got nine senators already sworn in, and we've got nine prospective ones that are waiting to be sworn in. That leaves around six places open, and we're hoping we can fill that over the course of the semester as well. Um, Aisha is our first one. Um, we've got Eliza, um, Ariel, Benedict, um, Jennifer, uh, Danielle, Emma, and Michael. So um, they're from various different walks of life, different um, experiences. They all bring something new to the table that we haven't seen before. We're also trying to build a bit more diverse Senate this time around. Um, we're trying to encourage participation from different clubs um, and basically from people all walks of life who experience the college differently. Um, so that's our main goal. We also decided we didn't want to kind of uh, just stand by our goals. We wanted to kind of incorporate all the senators in creating the goals. So we don't have a lot of goals at the moment that we're trying to um, do over the course of this semester. But hopefully in our first couple of meetings, uh, once I get to talking with them, get to know all of them and see what they want as change, um, we'll come up with our own specific goals so we can all kind of work towards as a team. Um, that being said, we are still uh, helping and continuing on with the goals of the last executive board and making sure that we kind of see those to success. Um, that's all from me. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you, and uh, good luck with all of your initiatives. Uh, we really appreciate <clears throat> uh, while the Student Senate has taken on so many projects over the years, and we're anticipating that that will continue. So, Anki, thank you very much. Have a great year. College lobbyist, Mr. Carter. Got a new phone. <laughs> this might be the student. This might be the student. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the of the board. Uh, I will. Uh, skip going over the report verbatim and just kind of highlight a few uh, areas that I think are, are going to be uh, important moving forward as we think about the next legislative session. Uh, the first issue being that of uh, tax policy discussion. Uh, that is going to be a large um, and encompassing issue that, that dominates the discussion this next legislative session. And in in doing so, we're going to have very uh, diverse views on what that tax policy should look like. Next week, the, uh, the governor will convene a uh, tax policy reform group uh, that she has appointed a number of, of uh, folks to. Uh, that group will begin taking a look at, at issues um, such as food sales tax reduction. I think they'll be looking at some uh, income tax uh, reform uh, or reductions in personal uh, income tax. Commensurate, you have a group meeting uh, at the Kansas Chamber looking at tax policy issues related to the corporate structure, uh, internet sales tax, uh, property tax reform, uh, and so you can write in parentheses dark store theory if you want uh, on, that, on that line. Uh, at the same time, um, you have the Senate tax chair who is, uh, has an ad hoc group that's meeting across the state uh, to look at various uh, ways to, to deal with tax policy reform. And, and certainly, I think one of the issues that, that either that group or, or the state chamber will be looking at is decoupling from, from the federal tax policy that was passed in 2017. There's a lot yet to come. Uh, from all of those groups, um, but it is a uh, it is a large conversation that will that will definitely dominate the the legislature uh, during the 2020 session. Let me talk a little bit about higher education budgets. Uh, just yesterday, the Board of Regents approved uh, the unified budget request that it will be submitting to the governor's office. That number is around 93 and a half million. Uh, that includes. Um, 13 and a half million uh, for bringing CTE and Senate Bill 155. Actually, the Senate Bill 155 piece will be a supplemental request, um, but that includes um, bringing all of the tax cuts back into uh, back up to par, as well as some new dollars um, for for higher education. I think the concern. Uh, that I began to see as some of the conversation played out both in the board meeting and some of what we heard in, in some of the committee conversations is there is likely to be a uh, conversation at the Board of Regents level 
on a statewide uh, mill levy for community colleges, and that's incredibly concerning, Mr. Chairman. Um, that, uh, I think there is a request that has been made to discuss it at the uh, committee level uh, in the month of November and to be on the um, board agenda in December. What does that look like? Um, I, I don't know right now. I do think that um, there is a, a regent that is close to a legislator um, in South Central Kansas that has concerns uh, about one particular institution. I talked a lot about it last, um, last session, during the legislative session. And so I think that when you have a, um, an umbrella board that uh, helps coordinate and advocate, advocate for higher education, uh, begin to look at issues like that, uh, that is concerning. I don't think it speaks for the entire board, um, but it's something that we need to be uh, critically aware of and, and involved in, and, and we will be. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Mr. Chairman, there is a link in my report to a, a study that was released uh, just last week on um, student attitudes uh, towards guns on campus. That is a, uh, a series of, uh, it is a, an ongoing um, survey um, based on some other surveys that occurred in 2016 and 2018 uh, from the Urban Institute, and I would encourage you to take a look at that. I do think with next year being an election year, we'll be having those conversations again uh, because it's, it's politically popular or unpopular depending on which side of the, of the issue you're on and, uh, and likely will be one of those issues that we're talking about at the very end of the, the legislative session. And then finally, um, uh, I don't know if the final version was approved over the weekend. Um, I think one of the trustees may have some uh, additional information on this, but uh, the KACCT board uh, developed a legislative uh, agenda, uh, not dissimilar to ours, maybe even a little more detailed uh, than, than what we um, use here at the college to help guide us when, when legislative issues come up. Uh, it, I don't know if it's out for public distribution yet or not, but it soon will be, I would imagine. And it, uh, it will help guide the association as it navigates the, the um, session moving forward. I don't believe they've ever had a document like that uh, in the past. And so uh, we supply, at, at their request, we supplied what we use. Um, and I don't know how it was used uh, in the development of their document, but I would just stop there uh, and see if there are any questions. Yeah, I have two, two items, uh, and we do have a KACCT report, yes. and either Trustee Lawson or Trustee Ingram can speak to that. But um, on the tax policy, are you anticipating any lightning bolts, any, any new ideas or issues that have not been discussed previously? Well, certainly when you talk about uh, the introduction uh, into the conversation of a statewide mill levy, that would be viewed as a new statewide tax. I don't see that getting a lot of play. Um, that is a highly charged issue um, and certainly one that, that we will be um, at the table and at the podium on. Uh, with, with regard to the remainder of the issues, I think everything is pretty much out there, uh, whether it's internet sales tax, whether it's reduction in food sales tax, uh, whether it's decoupling from federal tax policy, um, corporate income tax, individual income tax, all of those issues um, I think will, will be discussed. But I don't, I don't know that there are any that we're not already aware of that, that would I consider uh, lightning bolt issues. And regarding the statewide mill levy, uh, as I recall, that was uh, percolated a little bit through the county commissioners last year and died there. Uh, I guess my question of you is that is there any courage by anybody around the state to look at service area mill levies rather than a statewide mill levy? I think that'll become part of the conversation. Because we have a no number of service areas that don't have a mill levy assessment for the counties in which they serve because they realize it probably wouldn't pass. Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I don't know, uh, Mr. Carter, the, the Regents has oversight with respect to our um, curriculum, right? They, they don't have any statutory authority to implement a mill levy. That would have to come from the legislature to raise taxes, right? The legislature would have to pass some sort of statutory authority to implement a, a, a statewide mill levy. With, with regard to a statewide mill levy, um, they would have to have uh, a bill at the legislative level that does that. Presently, uh, the first, is it 20, 20 mills, 25 mills um, go to school districts, and then there is a one uh, mill 
uh, levy that goes to the educational building funds for higher education for state university campuses. But the legislature would have to raise that. They would have to raise that. They would have to initiate that and pass that and send it to the governor for signature. Quite right. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Carter? Well, Trustee Musil. Is the gambling revenue stream included in the tax, the interim tax discussion, or is that completely separate? I, you know, I think there's going to be issues related to sports betting. I don't know if uh, the, the revenue streams from uh, gaming will be included in that conversation or not. Sometimes we create silos uh, in the state house. I've not heard it in the mix of conversations that I've been a part of, but that doesn't mean that it's not bubbling up somewhere in the background. Part of the reason to even look at that is a revenue stream, right? That would mm -hmm. have to be a tax. You'll of course recall when the lottery was passed in 1986 that all of the, the dollars raised were gonna go to, to fund public education. Um, you probably have a hard time tracing those dollars um, even today going backwards. Trustee Snyder. If the Board of Regents was doing something that wasn't aligned with our interest, how would we address that? I mean, do you talk to Regents personally? Do you talk to Blake Flanders, Matt Casey? Is that Dr. Sopcich's role? How, how does all that happen? Well, all of the above of what you mentioned ha has occurred and has been occurring um, even this week. I think that the goal probably would be to speak with a unified voice through KACCT um, as as a group of 19 colleges to the Board of Regents. Um, and I know that their executive director has had some conversations um, with all of those folks that you mentioned uh, as well. Um, similarly, um, I've had some conversations with, with both um, uh, Blake Flanders and, and with Matt Casey um, just this week. Uh, and we have a weekly uh, government affairs group that, that gets together on behalf of the colleges. Uh, sometimes it's just a short conference call. Uh, during board weeks, there is a, an actual face-to-face -face meeting, and so there was one of those this week. And some of those budget issues came up this week, not, not the ones that I specifically reported on, but um, so I think it's a little bit of all of the above. While we have Mr. Carter at the podium, Trustee Lawson or Trustee Ingram, any uh, remarks to his question about KACCT? in either their legislative platform or the statewide mill levy? I have that um, the KACCT legislative agenda. It is public. It's okay. Yep. Uh, this is a public copy too, so it's very meaty. It's very detailed. Uh, so it's definitely worth um, a study. And I think Dr. McLeod can speak a lot about uh, some of the ins and outs that we're doing here. And there are some accomplishments, uh, like you mentioned, the fully funding that happened. That was a big accomplishment for the CTE, for the Senate Bill 155. Um, so having a, a good relationship with the KCCT, I think, is a really good step forward. And if that's something that you're feeling is worthwhile. Uh, I know you're also on the KBORS government committee. Is that still something that? There is a uh, group of, um, they call it System Council of Government Relations Officers, SCOGRO is their acronym, they love acronyms. And um, that is the, the larger group of all of the university legislative liaisons, um, the tech colleges, community college uh, associations, and then there are a couple of independent um, institutions that are represented like JCCC, I believe Cali College has a, a contract lobbyist as well. So. So I think that's a good, do you feel like that's a good place too for you where you are? Um, yeah, there's, there's the opportunity to exchange um, issues and ideas and, uh, and that's where that conversation occurs. And then of course, um, it, it's coordinated by the, the Board of Regents. Uh, so Matt Casey is being their, their government affairs person sort of coordinates those meetings. So we in essence have two voices because we are the lion's share of the membership for KCCT, but we also have you in that group because KCT lobbyist is also in that committee. So I think that's helpful and I think it's very valuable for us to continue a membership with KCCT because it helps the rural communities be able to have a voice at that table. So uh, is there else to well, I think the only thing that I would add in addition to that, and you did a really nice job of covering, but um, there have been a number of conversations that I think they referred to at the meeting this week, and that was 
with Blake Flanders, that was with KBOR, that was with the governor's office. I mean, there's just a lot of conversation that's taking place right now, and our executive director is new, but she is extremely well-versed and very well-connected and seems to be doing a really, hey, she's got her pulse on all of this. But I do know there's a lot of information that is being asked now of us. Um, and they were speaking with the presidents about that, I think, on Friday night. Um, so I'm not as well versed with that, but I know they're asking for a lot of information, a lot of detailed information on funding, and we're curious as to where that's actually going to end up. So. Trustee Cross. Very quickly, Mr. Chair, I just want to comment. I, I think that this administration and uh, this board, in my 74 months here, uh, along with Mr. Carter, have done an excellent job of paying attention to our interests and uh, uh, fighting for uh, for what we need from the legislature. I, I think they do a lot for us and we're thankful for that, but I, I also think that we're keenly aware uh, of what's going on and I commend us for that, so. Okay. And Mr. Carter. Very good, anything else? Thanks, uh, Mr. Carter, appreciate it very much. <laughs> Faculty Association, Dr. Harvey. <laughs> Hello. Um, so classes are in full swing, faculty are teaching, they're also organizing and participating in some incredible educational events um, for the community, such as uh, just this week, Once Upon an Artifact, I know a lot of my colleagues presented at that, it was at the Johnson County Arts and Heritage Center just the other night. Um, our students are learning, I do a research project with one of my lab classes, and it is organized chaos. Um, last Friday, I planned way more than apparently we could finish, and uh, we started at 9 a.m., and then I had to leave at noon to go teach another, another lab, and so I told them, I said, okay, just leave your stuff here. No one's in the, here in the afternoon, and I will come back and finish it. Just leave your lab books, and then I had two students who asked to come back and help me. And I was like, okay, so I told them when I would be coming back and they, they met me there and helped me finish everyone else's work. And we talked about their careers and they quizzed me about my educational history and what I did and how I ended up in this job. And, um, and then I had to go to some meetings and come back and clean up. And um, I was washing dishes at 6.30 by myself on a Friday night, uh, but then I finished. But I don't plan to do that much work again in a lab. I don't plan to, to, to choose that much for our lab that, in another day, but um, ever. But I was inspired by their enthusiasm and their genuine interest. And um, it was really something to have students voluntarily say, I'm free this afternoon. I'll come back and, and work more in the lab and it was really wonderful. And that is why I do this job, and I know that my colleagues have opportunities like that and experiences like that all the time with their students, that um, that's why we're here. Um, of course, I need to talk about a couple of other things, as I always do. Uh, first, I want to read a motion that was just made at my faculty association meeting today. Um, so I'll read that. This was just passed and uh, worded by uh, some of my members. Since it is an established practice in academic institutions that faculty members make up a significant share of search committees for presidents and other academic officers, and since this college is currently working to strengthen its commitment to shared governance, the Johnson County Community College Faculty Association calls on the Board of Trustees to support the Faculty Association's appointment of at least three faculty members to the Presidential Search Committee. The association also urges that the search be conducted in a fully transparent manner, opening all events to the public whenever possible. So that is a statement that was drafted by association members and I wanted to share that with you. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, over the last week or two, two different groups have formed on campus. We talked a little bit about it tonight. Uh, they're in response to the second HLC request related to shared governance. One is the college-wide task force, and the other is the academic branch, is about, it includes the academic branch, and it includes representatives from all the divisions on campus. And the vast majority of the committee, um, of that committee, I've seen the membership list, and the vast majority are FA members with few exceptions, part-time faculty, um, deans, but the Faculty Association has also selected uh, Dennis Arjo to represent us specifically in that group. 
and they are charged with researching and recommending an appropriate policy structure for faculty shared governance complete with an operational practices framework for the policy structure. That's their charge. Okay. Um, last year, our negotiations team presented a number of proposals as negotiations stalled. And this was an effort to come to an agreement. Many of our proposals didn't have any monetary cost to them, but they were dismissed and rejected with sometimes uh, little or seemingly no consideration. At least that's how it felt to us. And uh, exactly one year ago today, we met with a federal mediator to work on ending our impasse in contract negotiations. That was September 19th. And that day our team proposed a deal that we would accept the last board offer to end our impasse in exchange for an agreement that we would be part of a task force to fix shared governance. And this is the memorandum of understanding that we proposed. And it was a memorandum of understanding between the JCCC Faculty Association and JCC Board of Trustees. Parties agree to form a task force of no more than 10 persons, five of whom must be FA members appointed by the Faculty Association and headed by two co-chairs, one of whom must be an FA member appointed by the Faculty Association, who will research and negotiate a plan to improve shared governance and vertical communication as it relates to the instructional branch of the college. The agreement reached by the task force will be included on the college's report to the Higher Learning Commission due September of 2019 and will become part of the JCCC Master Agreement upon ratification. Both parties agree that the substance of the HLC report and the revised language of the Master Agreement will be in alignment. The task force will meet as needed until the submission of the HLC report, at which time it's allowed to contractually expire. The task force is, is authorized to delegate assignments to subcommittees or other branches of college leadership as it deems necessary. So this is something we proposed exactly a year ago today. And there was no guarantee that any language would be agreed upon. The point was that we would be part of the process of solving our shared governance problems and being valued in a way that was worth ending impasse for us. There are things worth more than money. And this was rejected, and we ended impasse with an additional parental leave policy instead. And this decision forever altered our hopes of feeling valued by the board and administrators who were part of the decision to reject our offer. Our issues during negotiations were never about money or fiduciary responsibility. It was more about power and respect, and that's how we got here. Had our proposal, our proposal been accepted, we would have had a different attitude leaving negotiations. We would have been included in the efforts to solve the shared governance issues here at the college. We would have been included in drafting the first response to HLC instead of reading it for the first time just a month before it was submitted. We would be a year farther along in the process and not pressed by this HLC imposed deadline and very compressed deadline as we are now. Instead, our request to be included and take joint ownership of faculty governance was rejected and now here we are doing exactly, almost exactly, the same work that we asked to be part of doing uh, and, and it's a year later. So I, I wanted to point that out because as we were all discussing it amongst ourselves, we were like, we offered to take on this work a year ago. Okay, so I also want to shift now to a topic of, that keeps surfacing, of mandatory negotiable items. So we also asked for a retirement benefit numerous times throughout negotiations, and we were rejected every time we brought it up. And suddenly, just a few months later, after we signed contracts, uh, the verb benefit that we're all very happy to have for our retirees, but looks a heck of a lot just exactly like what we were asking for during negotiations, that we would have gladly ended impasse for, was suddenly proposed and rolled out just a few months after the contract was signed. To our amazement, outside negotiations, outside our contract. And it puts us in an awkward position because it was something we very much wanted. We always wanted it. But then here it is immediately, just a few months later, rolled out when we had asked for it. This last May, we also had a, a, an issue with faculty evaluations being changed in one division. And it took a considerable amount of back and forth between myself 
and others to sort of communicate the why and how this was not okay. And um, it's been, it was a very collegial conversation the whole way. It's my understanding, and I'm hearing from faculty, that it's being resolved and the evaluations are being redone appropriately. And I'm gonna to continue to follow up with everybody and make sure that it's done and corrected um, before my window closes to um, file a complaint if I have to, but I don't think I'm gonna to have to do that. And that's not why I'm here, it's not to say I'm, you know, it's not to be threatening in some way, but this brings me to my final words. There are some mandatory negotiable items. And these are items that you don't change without negotiations. There's a list. It's included in the state statutes. And I realize that not everyone has time to learn them or look it up or find them. It takes a little bit to find them. You have to kind of know they're there and know what you're looking for. So I'm gonna read you a small section that spells out the major issues that keep popping up so hopefully we can be on the same page. So this is really just to be educational, kind of make sure we're on the same page, that these are the items that we have a union, you're supposed to negotiate them if you want to change them. And I realize that we do three-year contracts, so there's going to be stuff that happens in the span of three years, you know, and we feel rushed when we're doing it. And so there's going to be stuff that happens that has to be revisited. That's absolutely going to happen. But there's still a process, and it's supposed to be, things are supposed to be negotiated. Okay, so this is from the Kansas, Kansas Statutes 72-22-18 definitions. And I'm just going to read Part L, and I'm just reading Part A of that. Terms and conditions of professional service means, and so these are the items that are mandatory negotiable if you want to change them. Salaries and wages, including pay for duties under supplemental contracts hours and amounts of work, vacation allowance, holiday, sick, extended, sabbatical, and other leave, and number of holidays, retirement, that's the verb thing, insurance benefits, wearing apparel, pay for overtime, jury duty, grievance procedures, including binding arbitration of grievances, disciplinary procedure, resignations, termination, non-renewal of contracts, reemployment of professional employees, terms and form of the individual professional employee contract, probationary period, professional employee appraisal procedures, that's the faculty evaluations part, each of the foregoing being a term and condition of professional service, regardless of its impact on the employee or on the operation of the educational system. So I just wanted to read that out just because I feel like I keep having the same conversation of trying to explain the things that are mandatory items that if we want to change them, we have to sit down and negotiate. And I, I feel like, you know, we've been pretty collegial and pretty open to sitting down with folks and talking about things. And especially if it's something that we want, we're not gonna, we're gonna fight against something that we want. But there's a process and, um, and it's spelled out. There's also a process in here in the statutes that you know, lays out what, what we do if the rules aren't followed and what our options are. And I don't want to go those directions. I don't think anybody does. But I would like to just have a commitment from folks that you're going to consider that things that should be in our contract and should be negotiated should be negotiated and put in our contract. And it's in everybody's best interest. It helps the administrators who are trying to carry out the things spelled out because they can re reference it. It's right there. It helps faculty know what to plan on. Things like a retirement benefit, if we don't know if it's going to be there for at least two or three years at a time, it's hard to plan your life. So, Dr. Harvey, as chair, I'm going to stop you there. Okay. That's the end of my report. I, I would just say that um, in the spirit of trying to be collegial, mm -hmm. uh, I probably should have stopped you long ago because we don't negotiate or talk about negotiations in this setting. We will, in the fall of 2020, uh, establish the negotiation process again. And that negotiation team will begin in February of 21. And I would summarize what you've said in terms of what goes into the negotiation process. Uh, you're right, compensation workload is one thing to negotiate, benefits is another, but the third item, uh, parties agree to negotiate and they have a chance to put the items that they want to negotiate within that contract in those discussions. 
And so we have, um, we have a process to go by, as you have a process to go by, and that will begin, like I say, in the fall of 2020, uh, activating discussions for February of 2021. In light of collegial steering, I, th I think I'm accurate in that in our last meeting, I'm the only one that put items on the agenda for collegial steering. And for the benefit of the board, I would say we have representatives from the faculty senate, the faculty association, the administration, and trustees, and educational affairs. And the two items I put on were shared governance and the engagement survey, and no one else put anything on the, uh, on the agenda. I guess I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting more concerned that we try and raise these issues at a business meeting when we have several committees, and we're going to talk about this issue a little bit later in our agenda under new business, but uh, we have several committees, and collegial steering would be a great place. I, I applaud Beth Edmonds for saying there's hope, and we, are, we have hope that we're moving into a new era here with, with this shared governance discussion. Uh, in in the collegial steering, we spent half of our time on shared governance, and I got the sense, I, Nancy can speak to herself, Trustee Ingram, that uh, all of the groups felt, yeah, the process is in place, and uh, from the HLC standpoint, and I can't think of a better person to chair that whole committee than Dr. Barrett, who is a national uh, renowned person in HLC. Uh, the engagement survey, uh, Karen Martley is engaged with that. We talked about that for half of our meeting, and everybody seemed to agree that, yes, that process is in place and steps are being taken. So uh, for you to say that uh, uh, you know, the verb uh, situation was something you negotiated, but then it came on later, that was something the trustees really didn't have to do. It came after everything was all over. So I think we're at the point of who's going to get the credit for what. I'm not saying that the trustees should get the credit or anybody gets the credit. I do agree with you 100% that we need to work more closely together to resolve these particular issues. But this is not the place to discuss negotiable items. I think you're missing the point of my message. So the point of my message, so I probably said I wasn't clear. The point of my message is that I'm not asking to, I'm not bringing new proposals to the table today. The point of my message was, the last part of my message was to say that if the institution wants to make changes to the items that are mandatory and negotiable outside the three-year contract, they absolutely can approach us and we can negotiate those items, but they can't be made around the contract, outside the contract, without negotiation. So there's items that don't, if, even if it's in the middle, you can, you can make changes, but you have to negotiate them. That's what I'm saying. And so that's my message, is just asking that people wouldn't be working around our contract, but would be following the statutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Trustee Musil. Um, I'm, I'm frustrated because there appears to be a desire to create some crisis urgency on every issue here. You were represented by counsel throughout the negotiations. We were represented by counsel throughout the negotiations. There is a statutory framework that does that. Why you went to impasse, I don't know. I know they were at 3.5% and 3%, and what we heard was that you wanted 3.5% after starting at about 5.8%. So I don't appreciate the appearance that there was a one-sided balking at any reasonable agreement, that this board somehow came up with the decision that we don't like faculty, and that you can state it forever ended hopes of being valued by the Board of Trustees. I don't believe faculty on this campus as a whole believe they are not valued by this board of trustees. And the fact that we created a very valuable benefit for the faculty and the staff through the Voluntary Employee Retirement Benefit Program, it's, it's amazing to me sometimes that uh, I'm not looking for gratitude, I'm just looking not to be blamed for doing something that was to the benefit of everybody on this campus. And so when you, if we want to get into a legal discussion, we probably ought to have our lawyers get into that discussion about what the statute means and what we did or did not negotiate. As the chairman told us, each side gives lists of things we're going to negotiate. And then we, we, we do that because there's a statutory process. But this notion that you're sending to the public that, boy, the negotiations last year went to impasse because this board doesn't value our faculty doesn't care about their workload or their compensation or their retirement is simply misleading. And it upsets me 
because that's not what happened last year when it went to impasse on July 31st. And that's not what happened last September when we passed the collective bargaining agreement, the new master agreement. And I don't think it benefits us going in the future to have that continuing attitude that both of us have to fight each other over everything related to the master agreement, because it's not true. I'm not going to let this go into a two-hour debate tonight. I would say that uh, just last Friday, uh, I think it was last Friday, time goes by so quickly, we had an all-staff picnic. And a number of faculty and staff came up to me and said, thank you for the picnic, thank you for your leadership, we love working here. And so I guess I'm saying that to the general public, that this isn't a place where we have this ongoing disharmony between groups of employees and the trustees. Uh, I, I, I guess I didn't expect to have a lot of people come up to me and say thank you for a picnic. And I love working here, but they did. So with that, uh, Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Professor Harvey, I think I hear you saying, with respect to the statute, uh, I wrote it down, KSA 72-2218, mm -hmm. right, that you referenced. The statute specifically states if I understand what you're saying here, is that an item like that probably should have been renegotiated and that there are remedies pursuant to the master agreement if things happen outside of the master agreement. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. Thank you for your message tonight. Next item is the Johnson County Education Research Triangle, Trustee Cross. Mr. Chair, the uh, Johnson County Research Triangle has uh, not met since we last uh, did. The uh, next meeting for JSERT will be October the 28th, 2019 at the uh, KU Clinical Research Center uh, in Fairway. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, KACCT, Trustee Lawson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we had a good meeting in Neosho County. We certainly want to thank Dr. Inbody for hosting. I was really impressed with his auditing background and his commitment to transparency. He had a presentation uh, showing his website and a lot of the um, salary ranges, data, enrollment figures were all out online already, and I thought that was really uh, great to see that level of commitment. I think there are always opportunities to learn from other Kansas colleges, and this was a good weekend for that. So this report is a little bit lengthy, so I hope you bear with me because there was a lot of information. As you can see, this was the board packet that we received, or not the board packet, this was the packet we received from KCCT, so this is available to any trustees, and I can pass that around as well as the public. It was, of course, good to catch up with other trustees and to understand some of the very incredible difficulties that they are experiencing right now. Uh, issues explored in, uh, also included the KBOR on the student transfer credits to universities. We heard some of that with Dick Carter's update. But then also updates on the federal reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act, the Second Chance Pell, and college funding. There's a lot of gridlock at the federal level, as we probably are aware of, about how to support the higher education and which plan uh, is going to move forward. We discussed the upcoming U.S. Census, and the Governor's Counting Committee talked about how colleges can help encourage the counting process and to make sure that students and families are properly counted. The Census also makes sure that we have the right number of elected representatives. If size changes, so does the support from the state and federal level, so of course those levels are very critical. K-State came and did a great presentation about adult education and education leadership. We discussed the change in population that we are seeing in the state demographics, so that the majority white communities that are becoming majority persons of color, and how does a community college adapt to those changes in their community? How does their board adapt to the need for more inclusion, diversity in their board? and staff through their policies and hiring practices to help make sure the board is more reflective of their community. We also reviewed a new uh, KCCT bylaws, which I have a copy here, and talked about the importance of good bylaws for or an organization. Then the meat and the gristle, uh, which I almost, if Dr. McLeod is open and willing, he might be more in uh, ability to explain some of the real details that I think he's got the expertise on. The overall gist is KACC presented their legislative agenda, focusing on excelling career tech education from Senate Bill 155, we've heard a lot about. 
asking to fund the one third of the gap in tiered and non tiered, which is a nine million, but there's actually an update on that and I'll give that over to Dr. McLeod to give that information, which is um, really exciting. And have more discussions around high wage, high demand careers because there is a need to have more accurate charts that KBOR needs to look at that is more reflective of what is going on in the community colleges. So there's discussions about having accurate input for those charts and wages. Uh, of course, and then supporting concurrent enrollment and local control, which that's items that uh, Dick Carter had to say. And then the executive director alerted us that KBOR was lobbied by some groups to drastically underfund community colleges, arguing that the majority of all funding must come from student tuition and that we should all tighten our belts. Of course, KACCT will be lobbying against these kinds of efforts. Uh, and this was the flyer that was passed out in the uh, KBOR dinner that we all received. Uh, which was also very alarming. That concludes my report. It was a long, good weekend, and uh, I'll let Trustee Ingram uh, take over if there was anything else that I... I don't have anything to add. No, I think yes, just okay. the comments that I made earlier about some of the funding issues and the request for more information and more detailed information than I think we've expected and, and understood for a long time. So. Yeah, and then uh, Dr. McLeod, did you want to speak on more detail? Yeah, the big uh, the, the big shift was that the vote yesterday taken by KBOR seems to indicate that they will fully fund all of the programs still currently tiered under Excel and CTE, which could exceed actually the 13 million. Um, the conversation on the table went up as high as 21, but that is tied to the number of actual students connected to programs that are still tiered within Excel and CTE, because several of those programs will become untiered at the end of this academic year. So for this year at least, they have committed to fully funding every student who's a part of a course that is in that tier. Trustee Cross. Trustee Lawson, did you say the next, where the next meeting's at? I might have missed that. I'm almost done. So I I'm can, sorry. no, you're fine. I was gonna go over to the national and then the next ACCT too, but wanted to give Dr. McLeod that opportunity to talk about the funding that uh, level that happened. And then the next KCCT meeting is actually gonna be here at JCCC, uh, December 6th and 7th. Then we also have the national organization that we're a part of uh, October 16th through the 19th in San Francisco. Uh, Trustee Ingram will actually be speaking in the removing uh, policy barriers, increased uh, access to student success with Randy Weber. And then I will be speaking in a panel for perspectives on student policy. So I think that it would be a really exciting opportunity. And then uh, Trustee Ingram, did you want to speak about the committee that you're on as well? We haven't met recently. I think our next meeting is maybe the 14th. It's that week at, in San Francisco. So I don't have anything to report. Thank you. And then the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee that I'm on also has not spoken. We had a conference call that I reported to you in the board meeting the last time, and that would be the... Uh, I will present any information that comes forward, but at this point, we have not received an agenda for that. And that concludes my report, unless there's any other questions. And I'll Thank pass you. around the legislative agenda for KCCT <clears throat> and that flyer um, so that you guys are aware. Thank you. Uh, Foundation, Trustee Musil. Foundation, gotcha. Trustee Musil. <laughs> <laughs> About 50 foundation uh, members and other community leaders uh, attended the foundation social on August 22nd at the Hugh Libby uh, Career Tech Edu Technical Education Center, uh, led by uh, Dean Richard Fort. Um, the foundation will also host a, a uh, celebration luncheon on Thursday, October 10th, as part of the official ribbon cutting and dedication. The luncheon will be 11:30 to 1, and at 1:15 there will be the uh, public ceremonies, uh, officially opening uh, the, the CTE building. The foundation also hosted the annual scholarship celebration at lunch on September 4th, and the annual gathering of foundation scholarship winners. Um, they take a mic microphone around, and we always hear uh, very powerful stories about what difference these private scholarships make uh, to students who are able to attend the college. And uh, it says here I have to thank our own Dr. Jerry Cook for being uh, one of the microphone uh, walker arounders. We missed you. Yeah, I know. I, I, I hated to miss that. Um, Table sponsorships and individual tickets are available for some Enchanted Evening, which is November 9th. Uh, that's the uh, cap off the 50 year anniversary celebration. 
and it's the biggest fundraiser uh, for scholarship funds that the college has. Mike and Susan Lally are event chairs, and Frank Devisell is being honored as Johnson County of the Year. He basically built uh, Olathe Health Systems, Olathe Medical Center into what it is today. More than 730,000 has been raised to date. Hmm. Special employee pricing was recently announced, and we're excited to see a number of faculty and staff signing up to support this great event, benefiting our students. And that's my report. Thank you very much. Um, audit committee is the next. Uh, you have in your packet the minutes from the August audit committee. That report was given at the August board meeting, so the minutes are there for your uh, review. Uh, collegial steering, I've already spoken to collegial steering and I uh, don't believe I need to add anything. Uh, Trustee Ingram. Learning quality, Trustee Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Learning Quality Committee met on Monday, September 3rd at 8.30. Minutes are in the packet. Uh, the highlight of the meeting, for me at least, was a presentation by librarian uh, Barry Bailey on open educational resources, or, or probably, in my view, e-books that are, are free. Um, there, there are a lot of opportunities with this, also some, some challenges right now, uh, even though there are a, a vast range of of ebooks or open educational resources available. Not all are, are a perfect match for our, our course instructors, and so that, that evolution onto our campus is, is a little bit slow going at, at this point, but offers a, a great opportunity. And just to kind of underscore that, you know, this board has gotten bogged down uh, at times about a, a $1 increase or, or where that um, should be set. And, and by giving someone a free book, that could save them, you know, 100 to $400. And so just to put in perspective what the, the potential with, with ebooks could eventually be. Um, so I'll look forward to more discussions on that. I uh, have no recommendations this month, but there are two affiliation agreements in the consent agenda. And that concludes my report. Any questions of Trustee Snyder? Thank you. Um, Management, Trustee Ingram. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Management Committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, September 4th, 2019. We're in the boardroom. The information related to the Management Committee meeting begins on page 7 and runs through page 23 of the board packet. The Management Committee received several presentations from staff. Dr. Jay Annell, the college's executive director of the Center for Sustainability, provided highlights of the college's sustainability efforts. The college continues to make progress toward its goals to reduce energy consumption and to increase its reliance on renewable sources. With its leadership in recycling, energy use, curriculum, and projects, such as the bird collision study, the Center for Sustainability continues to be recognized regionally and at the national level for its innovative work. I'm gonna take a moment to add a little something in here because Jay's presentation included a list of the overall top performers among associate, baccalaureate, masters, and doctoral institutions of the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Ed. And out of over 800 institutions, we rank number 10. That same institution, and excuse me, the same association just elected Jay vice chair, chair elect, and he will be the first chair from a community college. So I wanted to include that. We're really proud. see him. I'm glad he's still here. Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President for Finance and Administrative Services, presented information on an agreement with the American Association of University, excuse me, yeah, University Professors. This agreement can be found in the consent agenda on page 41 of the board packet. Rachel Lears, the Associate Vice President for Financial Services, CFO, updated the committee on the year-end audit for fiscal year 2019 and initial planning for next year's fiscal year 2021 budget process. Our next report was from Ashanti Thompson, bookstore manager. He gave a presentation on textbook affordability and sales. He highlighted the options students have for accessing course materials, such as new textbooks, used, rental, and day one access, which is digital courseware. During the last academic year, new book sales, the more expensive option for our students, accounted for just 36% of all textbook sales at the bookstore. Janelle Vogler, Associate Vice President for Business Services, provided information on the competitive solicitation requirements policy as it pertains to local vendors. She also reviewed procurement services current and planned practices and recommendations for increasing local vendor participation. Next, she presented the single source purchase report. Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President, Campus Facilities and Facility Planning, provided the monthly progress report on capital infrastructure projects, and this report is on page 16 of the packet. 
Rex gave an update on the construction projects across campus and reviewed the report on the financial status of the facility's master plan. That report is in your packet on page 17. The management committee has a number of recommendations to present this evening. There were four recommendations based on requests for proposals or RFPs and bids. First was an RFP for the renewal of an annual contract for housekeeping services. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the renewal of the annual contract JCCC-1387 with ABM on-site services for ongoing housekeeping services for a current year amount of $1,032,367 and an estimated amount of $1,032,367 for the remaining optional renewers renewals through 2021 for a total estimated amount of $2,064,734 and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next was the annual contract for prime vendor for food and food supplies. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the renewal of the annual contract JCCC-1389 with Cisco for prime vendor for food and food supplies for a current year amount of $750,000 and an estimated amount of $750,000 for the remaining optional renewals through 2021 for a total estimated amount of $1,500,000 and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is the annual contract for athletic apparel, gear, and equipment. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the renewal of the annual contract JCCC-1383 for athletic apparel, gear, and equipment with BSN Sports for a current year amount of $200,000 and an estimated amount of $200,000 for the remaining optional renewals through 2021 for a total estimated amount of $400,000 and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <coughs> Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Our final recommendation is for the annual contract for the college's benefits administration and online enrollment services. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the annual contract for benefits administration and online enrollment services work with WorkTerra for a base year of $37,344 and a total estimated expenditure of $186,720 for all option years through 2024. And I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Yes. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Finally, as the board is aware, the college recently issued a request for proposal 20-006 for executive search and recruiting services for JCCC's presidential search. The Board of Trustees evaluated responsive proposals and at a special meeting of the Board of Trustees held on August 20th, the board heard presentations from four shortlisted firms. Following those presentations, the board unanimously voted to narrow consideration to two firms, R.H. Perry and the AGB Search. Procurement services staff then performed reference checks on these two firms and forwarded that information to the board. This evening, you have a short summary page comparing pertinent information between the two firms at your places. Potential recommendations for action are found on page 15 of the board packet. At this time, I will turn the discussion over to Dr. Cook for further action. Thank you, uh, Trustee Ingram. Uh, I want to thank uh, trustees for the time you put into this. We uh, scaled it down to four, had those interviews in a special meeting, and then you have unanimously chosen two for our consideration tonight. Uh, Dr. Larson, is there anything else you want to add to this before we discuss this topic? I don't believe so. Again, you received reference checks from procurement. I think that you've narrowed it to two very fine firms and really um, either could perform success successfully for the college. 
think what I'd like to do, thank you, what I'd like to do is go around each trustee, uh, make your comments about the two. If you have a preference for one or the other, we'll uh, follow that up with, with a motion and uh, hopefully uh, a unanimous decision. So let's start with you, Trustee Snyder. Any thoughts you have about these two firms? Uh, I, I think Dr. Larson kind of hit it on the head. I, I think both would, would are very capable firms that would serve as well. Uh, my preference is, is AGB, but I, I would be comfortable with either. Trustee Lawson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a longer assessment. I'm looking at the references and, of course, the confidential uh, fact sheet. I know when we're looking at a screening committee, when I was at the KCCT, one of the trustees that have been longstanding at the another community college mentioned a recommendation during their screening for president that there was about 15 people in a committee and it was a balance of trustees, faculty, students, business owners, so enough stakeholders that gave them the best candidate for their board to vote on. So I thought, I've been thinking about that a lot. I do have some concerns on the cost for AGB. It asks for, which was apparently last time in the public meeting, uh, one third of the salary of the higher of the top search fees. The estimated number that is shown here, I don't know if that is accurate because when I compare what we pay for a president at this point, I don't know if that is the cost that is based for this, if that's correct. The second question I have is what is the actual range of pay we are offering because that of course will impact the cost at the end of the contract if it's at a one third percentage. Considering how there are already roughly about $25,000 difference in the two firms, I'm worried about a starting base salary that is likely the difference between those two firms and that could actually increase. So those are things. My other questions about AGB is what is the baseline, the range of pay being offered, but that if the range of pay that we are offering based on this estimate is not exactly what we commit to for the person coming in because maybe there's more experience, maybe there's more uh, something on the table that warrants something of a higher base pay. This of course could impact that contract and as a result uh, increase the amount that we budget for this search process. Obviously they do financially benefit because the bigger the starting salary, the more they get paid. So I have some questions about how does does the board set the presidential salary cap with AGB or is the cap on top amount be paid that the search firm would rather you know, have than <coughs> just the one third base salary? So of course that one piece for me is, has a lot of weight and a lot of concerns that I've been thinking about. When I look at R.H. Perry, uh, especially the references as well. I'm really impressed with their presentation that we saw, which I found to be the best and most informative. And I felt it was really informative of the answers they provided. The articles that they write online were very impressive. They spoke to and do a lot of teaching for their clients around diversity, equity, inclusion. So it feels like RH Perry is one that is really leading the way for the term DEI. Uh, for their clients. They also had uh, strong notes that I remember reading about the solutions to help communities grow with their community college by bringing these issues to the table that others may at times overlook or maybe I just didn't hear them in the interview that we had uh, and as well as being able to adjust power dynamics. So RH Perry seems to be the better value considering the cost and also since we agree that both of these firms are really well, uh, it's hard for me to decide the more expensive one if we're both getting the same uh, quality of the organization and our typical RFP processes if it's something that's the same quality or the same um, value add then we go with the lesser one. So, I want to hear the rest of the board and be able to make a more final vote in a bit. 
Thank you. I'll try and answer your question on the, on the pricing. It is an estimate because it is that. And the more you discussed your questions, I think the more you answered your own question. The, the discussion of the salary for the new president will be determined by the board, not by the search firm. Okay. However, when we look at those resumes and those applicants coming in, then that too will probably drive our decision. But our decision as a board as to what we're going to pay the president will be based upon who that president is and uh, will be a board decision separate from the firm. Uh, and I think to answer the question, we, we have no range right now. Of, we've not, no one's talked about a range of what that salary may or may not be. Trustee Musil. Well, I'll speak to the salary just because I, I think we should all be prepared to hire somebody at a materially higher salary than Dr. Sopcich has, has achieved. Uh, Dr. Sopcich was hired cheap if you will, because he was on campus. It was an austere measure. Trustee uh, Cook said one time. Austere. Austere. Um, he has refused any salary increases beyond that given to anybody else on campus except for one year when we forced it on him and he gave all that money back to the foundation uh, in terms for scholarship use. So when I was chair and you looked at com comparable salaries with our peer institutions or the League of Innovation, um, Dr. Sopcich was always below the mean and he was always below the median. median by a significant amount. So I think, I think you're right to point out that we are, I think that number's low. Um, but as I said when we discussed, I think it was at our special meeting, I'm hiring a president for five to seven years. Uh, this college is hiring a president hopefully for five to seven years even though the average might be three years. And I'm not going to nickel and dime the process. Um, if they were dramatically different, but if it's, $30,000 difference um, over a five-year period of a presidential term. I'm not going to worry about $6,000 a year. Um, we certainly seem to spend less time worrying about $4 million in new money or whatever than, than that. I struggled with both of them. Uh, like Trustee Lawson, I uh, was glad that we moved R.H. Perry into the interviews, and I thought they were very good. The thing I liked about them best was community college experience. But when I looked at, when I went back over them in the preparation for this meeting, I did land on AGB. Um, I liked their, my notes indicate they talked about pre-search including K-12 and k -BOR, the ascending and descending um, institutions in the process of deciding the kind of president you want. Um, they talked, to, they, they convinced me that they weren't just looking at a, their stable of normal names. They were going to look for fresh pool. Um, I liked their inclusiveness, uh, both in terms of diversity and searching for candidates, but diversity of including community in the process of figuring out what our, what our posting is going to look like, what the job description looks like, and then when we bring finalists to campus, um, how, who we include and how broadly we include people to make sure um, that's true. They talked about training the search committee on, on implicit bias and other diversity issues that I think was something unique that they do. Um, and I guess finally, they, they uh, talked about the importance of confidentiality. And I know Dr. Harvey mentioned keeping the search process open and transparent, quote, whenever possible, I think was the quote. Um, uh, I think it's worth reiterating that we will not get as many candidates or as good a candidates if the search process is not confidential up to the point where finalists come to campus to interview because people are not going to re not going to put their name in, have it in the public so that their existing institution knows they're looking to leave. And that's just the reality. Um, I think our search committee will be uh, sufficiently diverse and we need to keep confidentiality in mind. And I thought AGB did a good job on that. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I, I end up coming down with AGB. Thank you, Trustee Lindstrom. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would, uh, I, I also like uh, Trustee Snyder, think they both are qualified. I would lean toward AGB and uh, would defer to my colleagues because I have not been able to participate to the degree I would like to in this process. Trustee Cross. I don't know the difference. Um, I heard them both. Uh, I think there was obviously lesser 
um, impressive candidates that we eliminated. Uh, I think they're both probably fine. Uh, my preference would probably be toward R.H. Perry and Associates, but this is no hill I want to die on, uh, nor do I think it's that big a difference. Like I think they're both excellent institutions. Uh, I do like R.H. Perry's community college experience, which has been said. I'm trying not to repeat things that have been said, but I, I really do like AGB's Board of Regents experience. Uh, as much as I might like to poke them in the eye, I do love them. I'm a product of theirs. Uh, and I love them. And I have indoctrinated my children in Kansas Jayhawk football because I love them so much. <laughs> so um, I think that's impressive. I, I could flip a coin. Um, but my preference would be R.H. Perry. Okay. Trustee Ingram. Um, much like Trustee Lawson, I had several pages of comments, but I will narrow it down at this point to, um, along with everyone else, I could be happy with either one. I did prefer and would suggest that I would feel like there's a little more strength in the experiences of the qualifications of the two people who would be leading us through AGB. And that's one difference that we have really not talked about. I did some comparison with both of the folks or both of the sets of folks who would be leading this. Um, the other thing that we haven't mentioned as far as AGB, um, they offer transition planning and that was something that they considered to be one of their, they referred it to, it was a key attribute is what they said. And R.H. Perry, said upon request, and so I just kind of felt like that drew me in a little bit further. You know, I mean, it's down to the little teeny tiny differences that you can find, but I think ultimately we're going to be prepared. They will all be well organized. They will be inclusive. We will find high quality, candidate, high quality candidates from each of them. But I still felt like the strength with the qualifications for the, the executive search team was stronger with AGB, so that would be my preference. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I like <clears throat> all of you. Think they're both really good, yeah. good firms. <clears throat> I appreciate uh, your concern, Trustee Lawson and Trustee Musil, uh viewpoints on the cost uh, and the AGB cost would be um, would be a variable. Uh, dependent upon the salary. Uh, they do, though, waive some administrative fees that our R.H. Perry does not waive. Um, I, I guess I like AGB from the viewpoint of their Midwest experience, and I'm not saying that our next president or a vice president could certainly come from Florida. Uh, but uh, I, I think AGB, uh, when you look at all of their institutions, Outside of the Kansas Board of Regents and university systems, they've had they've had strong experience in the Midwest. Um, I like Nancy. Uh, looked at the two people that would be leading the firm, and uh, I, I guess what I highlighted with Dr. McCormick, McCormick, he's a he's a frequent speaker on addressing characteristics of leadership, governance, workforce development, higher education, opportunity for the underserved and underrepresented. And as we look at uh, our diversity statement, as we look at our governance issue, as we look at leadership issues, he seems to uh, uh, have a little extra resume there uh, in addition to just doing, doing searches. So uh, I can go either way. I'm like Trusty Cross. I can, I guess, throw a coin in the air, but I, I, I really like AGB's Midwest experience and, um, and what their two... Um, their two consultants coming to this account will bring to us. Trustee Lawson, then Trustee Snyder. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you so much. So it sounds like the board wants to go with AGB. I do have some suggestions then because I think AGB would be a, a great firm to do the search. The concern I have is around the one third uh, pay of the salary. If there's a way because fees are always negotiable that can we look at possibly asking AGB to cap their fee at the quoted rate that's here? And because the concern I have with that is that this would free up the search for a candidate without the concerns of increasing our cost. So if there's a candidate that comes forward that 
negotiates a higher contract salary, that person is not taken off the table because we look at the contract that's now gonna go up. Right now, there's a 25% difference with increasing the salary at right now where President's object is to what might be industry standard, we might see a, a stronger increase in the difference between the two, but that we can also go back to the constituents and justify this increase, why we're doing this. But to also, I don't want to see great candidates that come forward potentially eliminated because you know we know that hiring a great candidate could increase what the pay is of the firm, but that we could also come to the table loaded up with limits because the increase in what we pay for the firm could harm uh, the college, it could harm the candidate or harm the public dollars, of course. So I'm trying to make sure that the, the firm is also not harmed by limiting the kind of candidates that they should offer because I don't want them to only go out and, and get candidates that are at the quoted rate. So having this cap, I feel, might provide that freedom from, with the board as well as the firm but then to also offer an option here, cap at the, the estimated rate right now, and any difference from where we are now to the official contract rate, that difference of the one third be given to scholarships for the students. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the students the, benefit. The, uh, and I, I don't know if that's a question or a comment. I, I guess you're, you're correct that we, uh, certainly can negotiate rate uh, with, with the firm. I'm not sure how uh, solid they are on that, I, I th but that's something we certainly can, can consider. Uh, Trustee Snyder, then Trustee Musil. Uh, the, the substance of what I wanted to say was essentially what Trustee uh, Lawson said. I guess my differentiation would be that um, uh, on a cap, I'm willing to go above their current estimate how much above, I don't know. Um, I was thinking 110, 120, something, like that. something that would give comfort that it's not going to escalate significantly. But I, I do like the idea of a cap if that is a reasonable way to move forward and allow us to take action, have procurement negotiate that and move forward. I, I guess I, I would have some concern if they said no and then we've now wasted a month in our process. Trustee Musil. Well, I guess I'm first of all making sure we understand the procurement process and can, are we in a position now where we put out an RFP, they've responded with the fee, we've interviewed them based on that fee and now we're getting ready to select, are we, are we okay? Then saying, well, we still want to negotiate some more. Jim, do you want to respond to that at all? We, we can negotiate that, um, like, um, so much mm -hmm. we, we can't guarantee that that will happen. Right. And I do want to clarify, the 95000 was not AGB's estimate. That was our estimate based on um, speaking with human resources and what the estimated salary. So, so the estimated salary of one-third would be 285 No. Yes. No, it'd be, no, it'd be 300, 385. 285. 285. 285. 285. 285. So, but the, and if that wasn't the midpoint of the range, then we look at it as the present, but that's just a midpoint. Okay. So even with that, I think that's an underestimation of where even we are right now. So that's my concern is finding out where we are right now and if we are needing to increase that base salary, where are we with this estimate of just how much are we looking to spend with there's a one third rule here versus someone of equal uh, liking, <coughs> equal experience, being able to have a flat rate uh, of 68,000. So for me, if all of our RFP processes have been, if we see something very similar, we go with the lowest bid. So I'm trying to understand how do we know what exactly we're going to pay. If 95,000 is already under than where Joe's, the doctor's object is right now, and if there's talk of increasing that, it makes me a little bit hesitant as to know if the if the uh, <clears throat> if the board would choose AGB tonight, uh, would it be possible to discuss with them a cap as Trustee Lawson and Trustee Snyder have suggested? Yes, we can absolutely do that. Yes. Um, I think that 
I think that the question becomes, do we, if they aren't agreeable to the cap that we bring to them, then do we wait another month to come back for your approval? No, I don't think we wait another month. I think that uh, the decision tonight would be if we can work out an agreement with AGB that is comfortable in terms of what that unknown amount is <coughs> on the base salary, and they deny that, then we would go with our <coughs> I think is what I'm probably hearing. Mr. Chairman. I'm not prepared to, I, I would say we, if we pick AGB tonight, we go back and see what they do on a cap. And then we just, if, we, if we're not, then we have a special board meeting or something to figure out if we're comfortable with that. Because I don't know what they're going to come back with. And we may have different comfort level, might be 105, might be 110. So um, I think as, if Jim and Janelle take them the, the concerns expressed here, I mean, I. I would I would be surprised if it's more than one ten, but there are salaries that are way above that out yeah. there. With <coughs> trustee crosses. I, you know, I would. Uh, I don't work hourly very often, perhaps like Trustee Musil, <laughs> but I would caution against a cap, as uh, I've been cautioned by colleagues uh, around the country that, you know, a number of these firms. I'm not saying either one of these two will, but they'll just reach out to an existing pool of talent that they have, and then say, boom, done. Like we did our due diligence. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I don't want to open it wide open uh, either, but I think a cap is, uh, with all due respect, uh, a caution against it. I, I would want them to go see or travel and meet with somebody that they need to rather than if they know their cap, they're just going to put in so much effort trying to bank profit from a flat fee. Just my two cents. Trustee Lawson? How, if we don't do a cap, how do we ensure that the candidates that are coming forward, because it's in their best interest to get a candidate that might ask for a bigger salary, because in the end they get a bigger salary, and I don't want to cause any doubt of the ethics here. I just want to point out what is there. So how do we manage that, knowing that that is in their best interest to get the biggest salary for someone possible? So how, how do we make sure that Someone could come to us and say, I think I'm worth $500,000. <coughs> if I may. There's no way to, the, that would be one third of that and we would be having to pay that. Trustee Snyder, then Trustee Cross. I, I don't, in response to that, I don't know if there's an explicit way that we can control that and verify that, but I think based on, th these firms all run on their reputation mm -hmm. and, and if they have a history of doing that, I, I don't know that their, their right. references would have been what they were. I think that's an excellent question, Trustee Lawson. I, I think if they're hitting Jackson Hole, Denver, you know, every major port on the West Coast to go see the sites, like we can begin examining, you know, breach of fiduciary duties or good faith and fair dealing, frankly. And I, I concur with Trustee Snyder that they're rolling on their reputation. So with that said, like I, I think it's an excellent point to discuss, and I thank you for discussing it with me. I, I'm just raising, frankly, having worked on a number of flat fees, it, it's hard to find motivation when you know exactly, you know, why put in more work or effort when you know exactly what you're getting paid. Trustee Lindstrom. I'm, I'm okay with the cap. In fact, I like the idea. I don't think, I think if it's a reasonable cap uh, and and if they go back and negotiate that or, or, or at least offer that, I don't, I think their ethics are going to be, if they find a more qualified candidate, they're, they're going to bring that. I think this firm will bring that to us. I don't have any fear of that. I don't believe any of us want the pool to be diminished because of the, what we're going to pay for the firm. And so we're going to have a lesser salary and none of us want that. And uh, this, this is one of the big decisions we make. So uh, I, I, if we pay a little more to make sure we've got a great pool, then I'm, I'm for that. So I guess at this point, uh, I'm going to challenge all of you and entertain a motion. Um, I, I, based on what's in the packet, I, it is a recommendation of the Board of Trustees to approve the proposal from AGB search in the amount of one year of the first year salary plus estimated additional expenses of 13500 to serve as an executive search for the college president with instructions <coughs> to our procurement staff to uh, negotiate a cap and bring back results to the board. Is that... Do you think that's adequate? We have a motion. Uh, or do you want ask a for number? A do you want a number in there? I think you could potentially bypass and come back to the board if we just, because we're in public studies, so we're going to avoid our hallmark negotiations. Right, right. It's a little odd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're probably watching. 
Right. So, but maybe to give a range or something to the team that goes out there, we can get somebody to negotiate tomorrow. And I would put one hundred and twenty thousand dollars on the salary because I don't believe we will entertain anybody in anything above three hundred and sixty thousand dollars, and I think we'll get somebody very good for less than that. We're lacking a second. To I'll, I'll, I'll Lindstrom has seconded. So, but but I also would say that uh, do we do we need to put a number in there if, if we just use the language acceptable? That's fine as well. That way, we're not giving away anything. We're just saying Re reasonably acceptable. Yes, yeah. and, reasonably that, and that, that that way it just comes. Right, right. 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 And, maybe yeah. the right. and, and they know what we, they they they've, they've been here right. and heard everything that's gone on here. So I'll take out the number. They know where I stand, though. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Trustee Lawson. Sure. Yeah. I move to make an amendment to this motion. I like the 120 and give option that if it needs to go higher for whatever reason, that that additional amount go for student scholarships so that there's not a punitive feeling of the firm if they bring someone in, that they still get motivated, they're helping students out, but the property, the taxpayers, they're paying 120 for the estimated cost of the search and then helping out. So if there's a small 5,000 extra, or maybe it could go to 35,000 uh, or 135, then there's no. So your your thinking is that in essence the college would be paying its own scholarship fund for any excess over a flat amount back to scholarships rather than the firm. Okay. Well, we have we have a motion for an amendment. Do we we have a second for that amendment? <laughs> okay, oh, oh, just a moment, Mr. Chair. Can, can we do that, Council? You, you need to have a second for the. Amendment. You're just asking for a transfer of money that would have been paid by JCCC okay. to the foundation as opposed to the foundation paying money back to the foundation. Yeah, I, 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 I don't see a correlation there. If we want to give scholarship, we can do that independent of this yeah. negotiation. I, I think this is becoming much more complicated than it yeah. needs to be. Well, I appreciate I, your thinking, and I appreciate your thought. Second. So we have a second on the amendment. Do we vote on the amendment first, uh, Tanya? Yes. I guess we do. So uh, if we want to have the amendment to the motion, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. The amendment fails. Read the motion. Does the motion deal with a cap, or I heard Lindstrom say reasonably acceptable? That was partly trusty. I will, trust. I will accept a friendly amendment to, a, to impose a cap that's reasonably acceptable to the college. It will be negotiated by procurement and brought back to us to make sure we're comfortable. Before with. we approve? Correct, yes. Before we sign a contract, before we authorize you or Dr. Sopcich to sign a contract. Yeah, I'm, I think I'll vote against that because I don't want to have another meeting in a week or two to decide who this is going to be. I think if we're close on the amount and we can allow procurement to advance to, to negotiate the best deal for us, otherwise we're going to be into October and now we're getting a little strained in terms of the whole process. So you, you want to pick a number? Is that, is that what you're saying? We either have to pick a number or we put it really acceptable and leave, and then you either give full discretion to procurement staff to negotiate whatever number AGB says, or you come back to us and we have the ultimate de decision about what the cap is. I, they could get it done for, they could, if we tell them, we'll do it at a cap for 108 and they'll do that. And they, but they, say they may no. take the cap of 95. I mean, they might say, we'll do it for 95. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm comfortable delegating that authority to procurement. I, I think they've heard the discussion. It's been recorded. I think they, they will execute a reasonable contract. I concur. And our plan with procurement was that the chair and vice chair representing this board would meet with procurement in the morning and with the firm. And this is one of the things that we can discuss as early as tomorrow morning. So what's your, you're shaking your head favorably. You're the one that made the motion. So what would the motion say? Same thing I said before. Reasonably acceptable okay. cap as negotiated by procurement. That's the board. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? So to, to clarify, nothing in that motion requires it to come back to the board? Correct. Correct. 
Thank you. Trustee Lawson. We could also make this super simple and look at RH Perry that does not have that clause for the one third, so we already know exactly what we're paying. <clears throat> and to be fair to RH Perry, the cost value is not an exact replication of their experience. I thought you said you were going to make this simpler. It's complicated. Call for the question. What? what? Questions have been called. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And I appreciate the unanimity uh, of the motion. Uh, procurement will meet with, uh, we'll call the company in the morning and uh, we will see what we can work out. Thank you very much for your patience and your time. Can I just say that uh, Ms. Wilson's reaction was one of my favorite moments in the history of a JCCC board meeting? <laughs> You what? She shrugged her shoulders. Can we do that? I, I don't know. I don't know. And I, we, I caught you flat footed in here, so I, I'm teasing. Okay, uh, any other uh, a report from the management committee? No, Mr. Chair. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, President's recommendations for action Treasurer's report, Trustee Musil. The board packet contains the treasurer's report for the month end of July 31st, 2019, uh, starting at page 24 of the packet. Page one is the general post-secondary technical education fund summary. July was the first month of the college's 2019-2020 fiscal year. We received grant payments in August of $11 million from the state, part of our state funding, and that will be reflected in next month's report. The unencumbered cash balance as of July 31 was 88 and a half million, which is 14 million lower than the same time last year. And expenditures in all primary operating funds are within approved budgetary limits, which is good since it's only the first month of the year. We need to get out of whack. Um, it's a recommendation of the college administration that the board of trustees approve the treasurer's report for the month end of July 31, 2019, subject to audit and ISO move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yes. A motion opposed. Motion carries. Next item is a monthly report to the board. Dr. Larson. Yes, thank you. You have the 33-page report from Dr. Sopcich of a number of activities and accomplishments across the college. Um, because these reports are prepared several weeks in advance of you, you getting them, you'll see several references to preparing for the staff picnic um, as was discussed earlier. The staff picnic took place on September 6th. I think it was a huge success by all accounts. We've heard great feedback, and I certainly want to thank all the many, many volunteers that um, made that possible and thank those who came out, including many board members. Um, I think we served 1,900 meals, so it was really a, just a, a wonderful event. So, you know, thanks to, to Karen and Susan and so many people that were involved across the campus in making that happen. We, we really enjoyed it and appreciated it. Um, we have a few um, presentations as part of the president's report. The first is Dr. Randy Weber, and he's going to um, give an update on our annual student satisfaction inventory. <coughs> I'm going to see it in advance. I'm gonna, that was it. Hope you like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. What I'm going to share with you tonight is, is our student satisfaction inventory, also referenced as our Noel Levitz report. Uh, we've got a lot of conversation going on around the college around perception of, of stakeholders, and this is what students are telling us about their experience at JCCC. A couple, a couple pieces of information here that the Noel Levitz is our student feedback. Uh, we use it and, and administer it annually in the spring so that way we can do some college planning and, and, and use for KPIs. This is a com direct comparison that we use uh, year over year for us as well as comparison data for other national community colleges. I'm going to skip the slide real quick and, 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 and tie this to our KPIs. The KPIs that our Noel Levitz contributes most directly to our course success and our full-time student success rates. This is an example of a, an externally measured tool that we utilize to measure our institution uh, as well as when we look at student success reports. So now I'm going to give you a, a, a 
quick cheat here and a heads up. There's, there's quite a bit of information to follow, so, so the, it's, it's presented in the very same format, so you'll start to see the themes here. What we look at when we look at the no leverage results are we look at how important this information is to students, how satisfied they are in it, and then ultimately what's the gap? So is it really important to students and are they very satisfied? So something with a narrow gap means that that, that, that satisfaction is directly uh, related to, to its importance. So low, low importance, low satisfaction, okay. What bad would look like with a high gap score would be something that's really important and they're not very satisfied with it. So in this instance, as we go through this, a low gap score is good. And what you see here is our results in, I'll call it goldenrod, and then in green is the National Community College average of institutions that administered it in the spring of 19 or in 19 as well. Uh, so, so as we go through this, you'll see as, as dotted around there, our satisfaction comparison to the National Community College average satisfaction, and then that's the difference. Now the difference, the big number is good. So low gap, good, big difference, good. And so that just means that our satisfaction is higher than the National Community College average. What you see here referenced is student-centeredness. That's a scale. There are a number of items that students answer that make up a composite score that gives us a score average. So in this student-centeredness, our satisfaction score is 0.35 higher than the average of the community college. So that's a good thing. So, Weber, what, you bet. What, what is the, the scale or range of... Thank you for that question. And I brought that, but didn't... <laughs> so it's a seven-point Liker scale. Um, so seven being uh, for, for importance, very important. Six being important. One being not important at all. Two being not very important. And the same thing for satisfied. Very satisfied, not very satisfied. Um, it being the lowest, so it's it's a range. So seven is the highest they can score with very important or very satisfied. I just have to say thank you so much for using a seven point scale. I'm sorry. I yes. Said thank you. Thank thank you so much for using a seven point scale. We'll pass that forward. Uh, this is out of our control, but we're very no hard. Levitts. They've been doing it around for a long time. They're pretty pretty smart at thank this, you. so they 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 must use that 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 methodology well. Um, moving forward with some of the results, there's two key takeaways I want you to ha take tonight. The first is on this slide here. There's a lot of information, but what you should see in goldenrod and green are our prior four years administration, and then the blue is the fifth year for each of the 12 scales that we administer. So the first piece of information I want you to take away tonight is on all 12 scale items we've outperformed ourselves over the previous four years. Student-centeredness, safety, security, all 12 of them, we've outperformed. <laughs> the little black dots are the National Community College average in those given years. So the first thing you're seeing tonight is we're outperforming ourselves and we're outperforming the national average in all 12 scale items. That is important to note. As we move forward and you start to see a lot more data, this is an example of how we'll use the information across the college, but different areas get their information from IR and, and, and pieces of information. So this first one is safety and security. And so safety and security as a scale has a composite score of satisfaction of 5.84. Compare that to the National Community College average of 5.54, we have a scale difference of 0.3. So that, that's a good thing. And what you see in each of the items in the scale is that our difference is higher than the community college average in everything but one thing. And that's the amount of student parking spaces on campus is adequate. Now you have to remember we administered this in the spring of 19 when we had a lot of construction going on and a number of our kinds are our spots were uh, taken up by construction. So we are hoping to maybe see a better result of this this coming spring. Um, it is worth noting throughout the entire survey, there were only two items where we had a negative score on. This one, and I generally know what is occurring on campus, and we've got some communication strategies around that. So every single item in the survey but those two, we outperformed the community college average. Trustee Cook. Randy, on the parking, can we drill down to say a parking space 
space convenient to me or parking space available? We can't, and those of us who have experienced higher ed outside of Johnson County Community College are always baffled by this response because we've seen institutions where they charge for parking. We see where we've Is frequently it? said in the past, we don't have parking problems, we have walking problems. A lot of people don't like to walk from the available spots. I will say this fall in the construction, we, we've had some parking strains and our police departments worked really well to try to open up some parking and some dry fields and that. Um, but in years past, you could find available parking. It just wasn't necessarily where you wanted it. Um, but yeah, that is, that's an item that, that some of us are like, I, I, I don't think they have good comparison because there are schools where they charge you for parking and there still aren't spots available. Randy, what was the other? Negative. The other was I generally know what's happening on campus, and I think it was like a 0.04 or a 0.05 negative. But every other item on the entire survey, we our satisfaction score outperformed the National Community College average. What a digital sign on the corner of Colbert. <laughs> <laughs> yes. we, we, we've yet to ask that. We can see how they do it year over year. Did that improve that? I see we're digressing very fast You only fast have two here. months to go. <laughs> If we get it, it will, we, we may have to name it in memory of you, uh, your time on the board. Uh, the next item is one, it's got, the next scale is, is one that's got a number of items in it, but I wanted to highlight this because this is instructional effectiveness, and this is, this is the core of what students do here. I'm able to experience intellectual growth. The quality of instruction I receive in most of my classes is excellent. And what you see is those are very important to our students. They have important scores of 6.65, 6.64. So even though they're extremely important to our students, they're still more satisfied than their peers across the country. And that's important um, for, for us as we look at how, how they're, they're guiding it. So a positive different score and in, instructional effectiveness. Uh, again, I'm going through this fairly quickly. This is just to give you examples of, of what we look at, how we look at it, items. Uh, I'll just pick one here. Uh, a faculty or understanding of students' unique life circumstances, a different score of a .32, but it's a 6.47 in importance. So this is the most important thing to our students. I will say the fastest growing thing of importance to our students is safety and security. Um, they're, they, they're, as incidents occur across our country, they become more aware of, of their safety and security. I don't know that it's been incidents on our campus. The third thing I wanted to highlight tonight was a, a, an item question that they don't measure importance on, but they measure satisfaction on. And this is a really key one. So our satisfaction on the, the scale of responsiveness to diverse populations, which is something we've talked about a lot here, is a 6.11 compared to the 5.8 national average. I have it from our, our IR department that our score of 6.11 puts us in the 94th percentile across the country. Um, that, that, so we know that this is an important issue. I share this in a way to say we do have efforts going on with, with DEI on campus that was spoken to earlier tonight. But this tells me that we want to get it right. We don't necessarily need to get it urgent because our students are telling us that we are doing a lot of these things in their, their eyes right. But it's definitely an issue we want to get better at as we focus on being a continuous improvement institution. So then you saw some items there like faculty are, are carrying um, uh, parking. And so some of the things some people own uh, collectively, and, and, and there are things around student centeredness like people at this place genuinely care about me. Well, that's a great item, but we don't know who owns that. So this slide here is some examples of some very specific items across the survey that areas will build into their performance review to say, we own this. New student orientation services students to adjust to the college. We know what department offers new student orientation. There are convenient ways of paying my school bill. I mean, that's got a score of 6.626. That's terrific. That's our Bursar's office who's put, this, this has been in their program review for a couple of years. They put a lot of intentional effort into trying to improve students' experiences. So this validates their work and also gives us some idea to decide what we need to work on. Again, if we looked at those items with larger gap scores, that's when we start to say collectively we do it and they've done a great job of improving their gap. Um, and then the other two on their equipment and, and tutoring services, so we keep plugging on those. So there's quite a bit of information here, and I told you there were two things tonight I wanted you to remember. The first was that we're outperforming ourselves over the last five years and the rest of the country. The second thing is this all-encompassing question that students were asked. All in all, if you had it to do over, would you enroll here again? 
nine out of 10 students would return to JCCC. That's better than five out of six dentists picking crest. Um, <laughs> but actually, that nine out of 10 says that, that that's a 99th percentile. The 99th percentile of community colleges across the country, when students are asked the most basic question, would you come here again? And they say, yes, I would. So I think as we continue to have these conversations about how we can get better as an institution, how we can focus on student success, and, I, and I'll point out that I've talked to you previously about student outcomes and how student outcomes are raising. So students are doing better, students are happier. Um, I know we want to continue to be a better institution. We say that to ourselves all the time, but I do ask as we have these ongoing conversations that we keep in mind that the, the voice of our students and some, some reminder that they, they like what we're doing. And I, with that, I probably didn't entertain any questions. Randy, I have two comments and I'll ask for questions. <clears throat> How is this communicated to our staff and faculty? Yeah, so we're working on that with institutional effectiveness to develop a plan. There are, it, it, there are different ways different cabinet members historically have shared their items with their areas. So for example, some, some departments across the country have already built their items into their program review and they start asking annually, where's my results? I need to, I need to put it in so I can compare it. Um, there are definitely opportunities for us to leverage this more and use it across the college to make more decisions and those are kind of conversations that we started with institutional effectiveness because we, I think we said we can, we can document administering this for the past 15 years plus um, and I think that uh, you know, I'm excited for us to get better as a college. I'm really nervous about our ability to improve these scores. These are phenomenal scores, um, but I know that we don't rest on our laurels. We'll continue to work hard. But My second comment would be, and, and maybe to the viewing audience, because those in the room uh, have a little different insight. A lot of you are, are staff and faculty and been to meetings here several times is that uh, if you observe this meeting tonight, there were differences of opinion on how we do things. Uh, I, I think everything boils down to how to write a news story. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And we oftentimes g stumble and stub our toes on the how part. I would say that I, I think a difference of opinion is healthy. Uh, now, how we come together with difference of opinion and work for the benefit of what just has been presented. We're all here, I think we're all here, for effective uh, teaching and learning for the benefit of students. And when we see results like this, this tells me that we have an outstanding faculty, we have an outstanding staff, we have an outstanding custodial and uh, uh, law enforcement team. Everybody on this campus tells me when you talk about student um, happiness and student-centeredness, that that's just not one person or one department. It's the whole team. And uh, <clears throat> I continue to be increasingly concerned about safety and security, just what's happening nationally. Uh, and so, Randy, I really appreciate you sharing this tonight, but I want to compliment our whole team on this campus. Uh, and we've got outstanding faculty, like I said, and staff, and support people that make these results a reality. Uh, and so thank you very much. Any questions of Dr. Weber? If I may. Uh, Trustee Cross. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, Mr. Weber, this is outstanding. Um, I think it's, you know, welcome news in a, what's been a difficult year. Um, is there a demographic breakdown for this survey in terms of who answered it and by, by ethnicity or? There is. IR is pretty intentional about getting that. We've not, um, we've not split that out because we've yet to decide, you know, one of the things we try to do when we look at data and that is if we break it out, how are we going to use it? So we're start first introducing ourselves to the uh, institutional data. They, they, they've shared that they do think have the ability to pull out if we have kind of a research question that says, you know, we want to know the response of this population. So a good example would be under um, responsiveness to diverse populations, one of the items was supporting the needs of students with disabilities. Well, that's one of the items on there. So if we wanted to specifically ask that population how they felt their needs were spent, we could filter to that. So it has that capability. We've just yet to really start slicing and dicing it until we figure out what's could, the question we're answering. Could we see answering. that perhaps upon request? Is that possible to? Well, again, I, I think I would ask what's the question, then we could answer it versus, because of that is, is it, we would, it would be, IR would break it out based on the question that's being asked. So for that, we would slice that out by that population. If 
there's a different population group that there's an answer for, like how did they answer it? The first question is, did we get that itemized to be able to, to get it? I'm not trying to catch you, man. I mean, I sit down with Netflix, I don't know what I want to watch. You know, I want to thumb through some stuff. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was just asking as an academic dork. I mean, I wasn't you, I wasn't a Gold Star student, but I was a Silver Star, and I wanted to just know. Like, uh, anyway, uh, with respect to safety and security, I do concur with the chair. Mm -hmm. uh, I know um, Chief Russell and others uh, helped us, you know, speak to the legislature, speak with some authority, and then I think <coughs> in the lack of wisdom from a previous legislature that passed uh, or allowed and guns on campus, it was Chief Russell that uh, got the phrase in my head, you know, if you want to bring your weapon to this campus, it's your weapon, your burden, which I think was a, a phrase he learned in the military. And so I share Trustee Cook's uh, concern for safety, but I, I think going back to the totality of the team from the, uh, the faculty to the administration, uh, there have been a lot of good things here, the great things. And uh, in any successful organization, I, I see frankly and candidly to this board and to this administration, uh, something of a tussle to determine who's responsible. And I think the simplest answer is we all are. But I did want to comment, uh, Chief Russell, because I can't repeat that phrase enough. It's your weapon, it's your burden. You sure. bring it, it's your responsibility, you separated from it, it's a violation of our code of conduct, you're in trouble. I would say my last statement is we were fortunate, uh, in addition to last th this evening's presentation, able to present this yesterday afternoon in our management topics meeting and said exactly that to teams. These scores are indicative of the efforts of all at the college, and uh, we received a lot of comments that it was that that they appreciated the message and and liked seeing the results. Good. Trustee, no, no I, anybody else? Thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. Dr. Larson. Yes. Next, we have a video. I think reflective of. Our student success from the foundation luncheon held recently. Thanks, Derek. The community here, I love the people here. They're so welcoming. Sharing that with other people and then receiving the same hospitality back is an amazing feeling that I get from almost everyone here. I am the first one to be in my family to be in college and being in college helped my mom. Um, may make this decision of getting her GED. I want to be a drug and alcohol counselor. Um, I have three years of sobriety. I've fought my whole life with addiction, but the best thing is to see my kids get to see me sober. And my youngest is at home with me. He'll be 16 this month. And he's just really proud of me. I work 40 hours a week and I come to school, but I mean, I'm excited like to see the world the way I'm seeing it now and to share it with my kids and the people here. I'm just, it's really a blessing. Thank you for being so selfless. Thank you for not only your hard earned money, but your time. Thank you for donating the wisdom so us scholars can excel and continue on our education, whether it be lower classmen or higher classmen. We're all on the same path and we're trying to strive for excellence. It's a privilege and honor to attend this college, and I'm just so thankful for all the opportunities that they offer here. That concludes our report. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Lawson. Uh, Dr. Weber, I just had one question. I think you mentioned this. Uh, what was the response rate for the survey? How many students were? I think we had approximately 1,200 students take it. Is that? Uh, I'm. That's the response rate. Close to 1,400 completed it. I don't know the response rate offhand, but we can get that. Uh, so there were 1,400 that completed surveys. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't believe we any, have any old business tonight. We do have one new business. I will, ha I will uh, give us all a chance to come back and make a comment about Dr. Larson if you desire. Uh, but uh, under new business, Trustee Lawson had uh, sent me an email regarding some concerns about our policy and whether we had bylaws. We don't have bylaws, but we have rules and policies. And so I would just open up the opportunity for you, Trustee Lawson, to share your concerns about our policies for the board. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My goal tonight is to really just kind of explore with the board to find out if there is agreement to have bylaws. I think over the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of discussion around policies in looking at other community colleges around the country, especially our own peer institutes, uh, institutions. There is a lot of boards that have bylaws in addition to policies and procedures. 
our uh, faculty association has bylaws, also the student senate, there are student, uh, the honor society here on campus has bylaws. There's other organizations around us. There's also KCCT that we look up to, put bylaws together, as well as the national ACCT. KBOR has bylaws for their board. They're very specific items around the difference between rules and bylaws, and there's a hierarchy of governing documents. Of course, the Kansas uh, Constitution is the highest. Uh, the lawyers in the room uh, have more say into you know what exactly some of those hierarchies are, and I'll leave that to their expertise. So part of what I would just like to explore is just finding out if this board would be interested in having bylaws, streamline process, make the uh, productivity, uh, provide accountability, of course, transparency with the clarity so that people know input process as well as dissemination of information. This could also be very helpful for onboarding process for any new trustees. As we have an election, we know we're going to have at least one new trustee. Also, the onboarding process for a president. So those are items that I'd just like to turn it back over and find out if the board is interested. Well, thank you. I've been on the board now 10 years. And uh, as I, I look back during that time, uh, <coughs> whether they're bylaws or policies, I, I'd like to remind this board that we're really driven by three major three major areas. Kansas statutes, one in our policy, uh, HLC certification requirements, and then our own JCC policies. Last month, I distributed to this board uh, a whole series of policies uh, regarding the board. Uh, I think one of the issues Trustee Lawson raised with me is you did give that to me seven days in advance, but you said you couldn't find any place where there was a policy on that. And there is a policy on the seven-day advance. It's actually... Um, uh, on uh, uh, meetings of the board, uh, which is policy 112. But we have a whole series of 100 uh, policies. Let me just review them again. Duties and responsibilities supported by Kansas statute. That was revised in January 18 of 2018. And I think this board, uh, with the exception probably of <coughs> Trustee Snyder, uh, was on that board at that time. Really? Number and selection of trustees is explicitly outlined by Kansas statute. Most of these were revised January 18 of 2018. Officers policy, duties of the officers, committees policy, uh, what the committees form, and I think there's a, a line I'd like to reinforce there that I think Dr. Larson referenced earlier in her open forum statements. The committee system is not intended to supersede the primary responsibilities and leadership roles of the president and administration. And so I think this notion of committees solving lots of issues and problems and, and uh, getting into micromanagement is not the purpose of the committee. Meetings of the board, uh, that's where the seven-day notice of agenda placement is made. We have a policy on that. We have a policy on professional development. And uh, uh, you, you, for one, have taken really good advantage of, of professional development for trustees, as well as others that have gone to the Congress and the Legislative Summit. Uh, we have a code of conduct, which is policy 114.01. Uh, actually, that originated in 1990, but was uh, revised again in uh, January uh, uh, 1, uh, uh, January 18th. Code of ethics, uh, revised, uh, again, Kansas statute, and a resolution of censure policy. So I guess if there are other bylaws that you're thinking of that could be a policy, that are not included in those several policies we already have for board members, uh, we certainly could go through the policy procedure of creating those, just as this board has done since its inception years ago. And I, and I think whether it's called a bylaw or a policy, uh, is, is, I guess I would, I would defer to our in-house counsel the difference between, uh, for this college, a bylaw and a policy. Tanya, do you? <clears throat> Right, so a lot of times a corporation would have bylaws, and since we're statutory entity, we rely on state statutes as the original kind of over or authority over the college. So the bylaws have been approved by the board of trustees, or the policies have been approved by the board of trustees. They're very similar to what you would have in bylaws or articles of incorporation. Some of the structure with respect to committees, officers, um, the positions that we have along with what the duties of the officers are, et cetera. So 
I kind of agree with what you said, Dr. Cook. I don't know what in addition we would want to look at adding, but it could go into, it could be an amendment to the existing policies for sure. And I don't know, I think that, I saw something from KCCT, I think their bylaws do have a lot of the same provisions that are sitting in our policies. It does address officers and it has some other, I think, financial information in there, but that would be more in our 200 series. And a lot of that's driven by state statute as well with respect to our funds. So I'm not sure what the, um, what the unique areas are that we want to look at. Trustee Musil. Well, I, I, I'm a nerd. I keep these in my notebook because I had them when I was chair and you needed to refer to them about how to run the meeting and what, what was obligated to do. But I think you, you adequately described those, Mr. Chairman. There, our, our policies tell us everything I think we need to know about meetings, committees, votes, obligations of trustees. If there is something that you specifically think we are missing, um, we have a process to evaluate that. I, I don't know what problem we're in search of solving um, at this point because of, I, I've not heard anybody say this policy is inadequate or this one is wrong. In fact, we, we did it in January of 2018 because I didn't get it done in December of 2017 when I was still chair. And Tanya was pushing me and we, were, we went through the process of re, revi, re, revising all of those policies. And if I remember right, they were unanimously approved by this entire board. So I don't want another layer of language and bureaucracy uh, layered over board policies, which do all the same things, I think. I'm not a corporate attorney, but when you look at what, a, what normal bylaws include, they include the things that are already in our, in our uh, policies. So um, I'm, I'm always open to listen to a specific problem that's out there, but I haven't heard that yet tonight. Trustee Ingram. Well, I think I would just have to lean on council. You know, so if you're satisfied with that and you feel like we're covered, if there's not anything specific that, that you believe is not covered, Trustee Lawson, I would defer to, to council. Is there, is there something at all? No. Okay. I think that when you look across the country and you have other boards, governing boards specifically, that are instituting bylaws. There's 16 out of the 20, or it's about two thirds of the peer institutes that we look up to have bylaws for their board. I think bylaws are a clear approach of knowing procedure and process. That is something that's different than policies and procedures in the hierarchy of governing documents. I just thought it was something worthwhile Time. looking forward. We can go look back. I'm guessing that those bylaws may be the equivalent of a policy at that. It just happens that we, when I got here, the 100 series already existed. It could have just been that the policy structure here was only with respect to students and employees, and that the board had, you know, 50 years ago adopted bylaws. But at some point, they adopted all of their requirements with respect to meetings and officers and code of conduct and conflict of interest into this 100 series, is my guess. I can go back and look at that history, perhaps find something. Trustee Lawson. Um, Trustee Lawson, do you know if those peer institutions also have bylaws that, that, that have bylaws also have policies? They have both? Or they have one or the other? I can bring those forward and present them to the board if you'd like. No, do they have both or do they have one or the other? When I looked up the bylaws, <clears throat> it was, there were some institutions that had both. Some of them, it's in a long form where everything is together. They had bylaws, and then the second half was policies and procedures. Those were separated. Was there a justification for those institutions moving in that direction that was explained in what you're presenting? That could be something that we can look forward if this goes forward. Yeah. Uh, I, I, would, I would be interested in hearing that information, but I, I also think that policies and bylaws are really just uh, semantics. I don't know that it's a difference. It, it, that's how I look at it. I'm not, I'm not saying I have the answer, but that's certainly my knee-jerk reaction to this. Trustee Cross. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I, I'd like to tell you I'm from a freedom-loving people, but I also welcome rules and regulations. So uh, I'd like to hear more. Um, Certainly, I think when, when, you, when the Ten Commandments were issued, there became a day that those were outdated or antiquated. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm open to exploring if there's a need for um, 
more. I just, uh, I, I concur with Trustee Lundstrom. I mean, it, it would be interesting to look at. I'm not saying it's not a worthy endeavor. I just, um, <coughs> Not sure why we would need it. Okay, well, if, if our council could look into uh, a little more definitive explanation between bylaws and policies, I, I believe we have uh, several uh, effective policies and we just need to apply by them. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm very concerned about sending staff on a goose chase. Yeah. I don't know that's wild, but to what end? What is it that you think we are lacking today other than a document that says bylaws instead of policies? What would, what would that be different about that document than is already in our policies? If I, if I could take that real quick. Um, I interned for uh, a political organization in Topeka uh, right after I graduated from the University of Kansas. And um, went to DC, worked for an amazing uh, that set of politics, an amazing hierarchy of bureaucracy to work for different institutions in a conglomerate. And there are absolutely people that seek out uh, policies and procedures and bylaws and everything. And, and I, you worked in that town too, so you have some idea. Uh, and I think here it's an interesting <clears throat> issue to be raised. I, I share your concern. I don't want staff out on wild goose chases, but I think she's merely raising the issue of perhaps outlining in some and my simple question spend is: spend too much time on it right now, just to be clear. But to, I'm just saying to what end? Issue. What is it that needs to be outlined that is not currently in well, our policy? That's a fair question, sir. I mean, that, and I, I'm not putting it on the spot now. I can come back and tell us, but that's, you know, to say we need bylaws. Period. I just I, I don't know what we're bylaws. trying to address. <laughs> well, if I may, I, I, what I heard you say, uh, Trustee Lawson, is that there are peer institutions that have this. And they have it for a reason, so maybe it's a reason. Maybe it's a best practice that we should look at too. Is that what I hear you saying? Mm -hmm. Correct. But there's not a specific thing that you're uh, trying to drive at within those bylaws. Is that also what I hear you say? Correct. I'm not looking for a problem or a goose chase. I'm not looking for specific. I'm not presenting any bylaws. I'm curious about exploring the idea of best practices that other peer institutions, governing boards that we look up to have bylaws, that bylaws can actually reduce regulation because it provides clarity in the way we communicate, it provides clarity in what expectations are for the public. So it's giving a structure for how we operate. And, and, and I heard you say that and I interpreted it that way, but I think our policies do that. Uh, uh, there may be a difference of opinion on the board uh, to that, to my response there, but I do think the policies do that. And I, that's why I asked you a question about why those institutions have implemented, if they have both, what is the reason there? And that's, that's, the, that's really the answer that I'm looking for. Mr. Chair. Let's, you know, Trustee Cross. Um, perhaps it's an issue for learning quality to explore. Perhaps it is something that I'm raising the issue, and I, I need to apologize to you. I don't really think I you thought Jay Cert would look at that. <laughs> I'll take, let's, uh, I'll take it to Jay Cert. So move. Let's do it. <laughs> let's uh, let's let management deal with that particular issue right. and uh, give further study, and we'll bring it back uh, at another meeting if that's the case. So. And I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the discussion. I don't really think that you need bylaws. Schedule, Next item is the consent agenda. It's the time when we uh, vote on a number of routine and regular items, unless a board member likes to pull an item off the agenda, I would ask for a motion. Mr. Chair, A3, the USDA grant, somebody could just... That's a favorite for you. We'll pull out A3. I like it. Any others? I would entertain a motion for approval. So move. Is there a second? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. A3, Trustee Cross. The USDA Sustainable uh, Agriculture Grant. Uh, that's something that Stu Schaefer got passed. Is there, when, when will that take effect? May I ask someone? Jay is here. We talked a little bit about it before the meeting, I guess. And uh, uh, Melinda's here. Too. Melinda oh, okay. I'm well. sorry. I'm, I'm excited office. about it. I saw it. I was just, frankly, yeah, letting please. you know I read it. I think that's when will this? Thank you. When will the six new courses begin? I'm sorry? When will the six new courses begin? Uh, 
I believe this is a, a two-year grant, and so we're going to be implementing, developing the curriculum um, in year one, so over the next 12 months, and then implementing it, getting it through a pandemic. Through a pandemic. What will be the utility of the two-year degree? Will they be able to transfer to K-State? To, to give you my understanding of that, Stu's, um, this is one of the places where the master agreement, uh, I, I will point out, has provided some space for him as a senior scholar. He's actually using this two-year period to build out that curriculum. The grant is an integral part of, of that um, and providing him some resources to both bring in experts but also to do some extended research. Uh, the hope is that we will create a program that is transferable and that connects to agricultural schools, but also like provides, uh, hopefully, <laughs> uh, it, possibly a place where people wear a lot of purple, but also a- uh, Iowa State too. Uh, but also <laughs> places, like, but also places, places like Iowa State where we do have, because our horticulture <laughs> students right now have a pipeline going to Ames. And so we're trying to figure out how to create the most effective pipeline for our students in sustainable agriculture to reach our ag schools and have all of that curriculum be useful to them. So. And I believe we'll be the only two-year school in Kansas that has a two-year certificate for sustainable agriculture. And I think part of that is a result of the grant. So uh, it really puts us in high cotton. Uh, do we, did we, do we need a motion? For yes, we do. Way? Is there a motion to approve, move to approve that grant second. or second his motion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Before we adjourn, uh, I would like to uh, make a comment about Dr. Larson. Uh, as I said earlier, this is her last meeting and first as president. The two aren't related, by the way, <laughs> uh, or at least sitting in this, in this seat. And uh, you came here at an interesting time for this college. Uh, and, and I, we were very fortunate to have you. Uh, I don't know how many of you know in this room, but I know many people in the public don't know that Barbara has, has uh, several responsibilities. It's not just managing finances. We're in a $105 million um, college enhancement program. Rex Hayes, you've been a rock star with that whole thing and uh, really appreciate your efforts as well. But uh, Barbara has decided to retire and I thought I would uh, like to share a piece with you as the people think about what they're going to say. And many of you know that one of my favorite writers is Edgar Guest. And uh, I wasn't going to tell you what the name of this title is, but uh, of this p little piece is, but I will because I think everybody in this room uh, gets captured by this. And so I've edited only the last paragraph. But here's, here's what Edgar Guest has to say about work. For this and that and various things, it seems that men must get together to purchase cups or diamond rings and discuss the price of leather. From nine to ten or two to three or any hour that's fast and fleeting, there is a constant call for me to go to some committee meeting. <laughs> the church has serious work to do. The lodge and club has need of workers. They ask for just an hour or two. Surely I will not join the shirkers. Though I have duties of my own, I should not drop before completing. There comes the call by telephone to go to some committee meeting. No longer may I eat my lunch in quietude and contemplation. I must foregather with the bunch to raise a fund to save the nation. And I must talk of plans and schemes the while a scanty bite I'm eating until I vow today it seems my life is but one committee meeting. <laughs> when over me the day shall end and my retirement experiences are winging, in that beautiful land of Virginia, <laughs> where all is bright with joy and laughter with singing, I hope to hear my husband say, and I shall thank him for the greeting, come in and rest from the day, Barbara, <laughs> for here there is no committee meeting. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you for your leadership in all of those committee meetings and the various <laughs> roles you play. Uh, one thing that I learned more about Barbara tonight is her humility. And she grabbed my shoulder, my, my coat, a little while ago, and she said, everybody wants to go home. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> so any comments? Well, I, I want to go home, too, Dr. Larson. But I won't do it without thanking you for the years of service to this college and community and to you and your husband. Uh, the best in retirement. We, we tend to take for granted around here that um, things will run right. Um, you have responsibility for $160 million a year and $110 million uh, faculty or a facility improvement plan. And, you know, for those of us on the board that have the level of trust we have in what you do and what your team does that's out there, um, it is just a great comfort to know uh, that you are in charge and we're going to miss you. Trustee Lynch. I vote no. <laughs> I, <laughs> Barbara, thank you. Uh, thank you. You, you um, honestly, uh, you're, you're one of the joys of, mm -hmm. uh, of being associated with Johnson County Community College. Thank you. Thank you so much. This That's is, awesome. oh, thank you. If I may, congratulations on your retirement. You'll be missed. And I think you, like the rest of the administration, demonstrate uh, some good decisions by Dr. Sobchak. <laughs> Six years and uh, the confidence that we have, and certainly the results that we see tonight are in part mm -hmm. due to your hard work. So thank you. Thank you. I think it's the the comments that I've heard over the last several months that have really struck me, and I know what our relationship is like with you on this board. But when I hear other people say how much they are going to miss you and how helpful you have been. We do take it for granted. We do take it for granted. So thank you very much. You will be missed. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I have some bad news for you. What is that? The lantern fly is uh, invading the East Coast. Ah, uh, yes. And so you better watch out for that great vineyard of yours. <laughs> thank you for your well wishes. This has been a a really uh, unique meeting in that I think we've talked about students perhaps more than we have in some time and and this is just such an amazing place and we make such a difference for students thanks to all of all of us so I really appreciate your your kind words and I will I will truly miss it here thank you motion to adjourn if you don't mind uh, so our, our next meeting next month is on Halloween so thank you for the indulgence of moving that up an hour but uh, I, I would request, as we set the agenda, to, to keep it light. Uh, I've got kids at home, as do many other here, and grandkids and others. Uh, and, and in fact, I will probably need to dismiss myself I, around 5.30 that I night. will second that, as this is not a hill I want to die on. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> let, let me say that uh, we, we, will need to, we will need to clear with administration as their schedule. But uh, I was going to be gone on the 24th. Uh, Dr. Sopcich was going to be gone on the 24th. Uh, I think his plans have changed, and uh, we will be visiting with Dr. Sopcich in the morning. I think you guys are back from we're back. ACCT. So if you don't mind, we're going to pursue putting the meeting back to the 24th of October. All the better. Thank you. Are you so, so two points there before you agree? So he is scheduled to go to, he'll be in Calgary potentially for the league board. He's not going to the league board? Going. Okay. The other one I have is I am going to be gone that day in Calgary for the league board meeting, and I'm supposed to give an update on promise. Let's just go to so let's let's do it on the 24th. And uh, no, I'm just kidding. no. That's fine. I, I, I'm okay not <laughs> No, we will. We're just going to that to be the reason. But if we can, we're I'm going to review this. those issues tomorrow. Okay. And, but but if you get a note saying we've moved it, we will. But don't do anything until Miss Schley uh, sends you the, the note. Uh, all in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Have a good evening. I move. Great second.